them during the processes. Therefore, to avoid or to mitigate any subjectivities, institutions are guided by those procedures. And I want to assure you that everything that was done, it went through a very thorough scrutiny. It went through a lot of questioning and it was based on evidence. Those institutions, if those laws are not applied, then there, will be nothing, there, there is no need to govern in any situation and there is no need to talk about development. What was used to deal with this matter was dealt with, dealt with by all the instruments I have called and as used, they, are, they are used as sources to make us reach that, 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 that level. And there are certain misdemeanors that were done. You are working with an institution. You are supposed to have that confidentiality. You are supposed to respect the rules and regulations. You have to follow the GO and government orders and other internal rules and procedures that are supposed to guide the term of work and engagement. If they are flouted, what would you say? If they are flouted, do we have to accept the fact that they are exercising their rights? As I said in my presentation, they have rights to raise their issues. They have right to write petitions, because it's just, those are rights put in the rules. But there is a manner and procedure that those things are supposed to take for people to go with, uh, with uh, uh, for, for responses to be done. But to the fact that you are giving an ultimatum, that I will not do this until this happens, then we might as well close the whole country and then uh, leave it to, li to be what it is. We must apply rules and regulations. We must apply procedures, and that was not done. I want to tell you that when these things were looked at and reviewed, that was why those rights that infringes on their right to work were all recognized and respected. And I think I want to give credit to this government for accepting certain procedures where there are lacunas, where there are gaps, and where there is need to improve on them and be stoical, be professional enough to accept them so that we can improve the rules, we can improve the regulations, we can include the governing instruments that govern us at different directions. With regard to job security, we do not have any personal sentiments against any of those workers. I don't even know them. We've not met them in a way that they think that we are going to say what you are doing is wrong, but we were calling them to accountability. The engagement that were done was based on fundamental freedoms and the liberty and freedom of engagement based on rights. So the job security that you are talking about is definitely guaranteed. If it was not guaranteed, how would they be back? And I can assure you, this government is a hallmark of professional ethics and standards, and we are going to uphold that. Their job is secured. Whatever they do is going to be taken on the basis of uh, institutional procedures and not because they have been reinstated. Is their right? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honorable Member for Central Badibu. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and thank you, uh, the Vice President, for those responses and the step taken to ensure that those people are reinstated back. Um, Honorable sorry. Speaker. Um, sorry, let me just do a little bit of guiding. Let's appreciate and understand that we are dealing with supplementary questions. And the purpose is to clarify in case there is any ambiguity, but not to bring up new issues. You see, we've taken a lot of leeway bringing in new issues that are not directly linked to the, to the parent, um, 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 to the original question. So let us try as much as possible to ask for clarification. Yes, and I, I, don't, I, I, I don't want to stop anybody from asking any question, but let it be related. There are rules, hmm? and it's applicable. Not, I don't mean you, I mean everybody, generally. Let's just be guided by the rules of procedure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Honorable Speaker, can the Honorable Vice President inform this August gathering since he see agrees that there are lacunas in our operations or in our institutions that lead to all this trouble, whether they have new strategies to ensure that people are given the natural justice of other than, other than party when issues arise? Thank you very much. This is a very good question. As I said very clearly, that this engagement and this event has created a situation where we were sit, able to sit down and reflect, look at the gaps, which I clearly felt here, and see what were the lacunas and the gaps so that we will come together and make sure that we get the institutions right. And it was on the basis of the lack of signing of those documents that were cogent uh, reasons and other factors that we said we give them the benefit of the doubt and allow them to come back. Their benefits were paid. They were given letters to show them what their duties are and all other administrative procedures that were to be taken have been taken. And for me, I think this is a big success for justice. For the fact that we are coming in, in when certain institutions were almost weak. If we acknowledge that we inherited a lot of weak institutions and we need to fix them right. We will be tested on all grounds. And the fact that we are coming from different um, backgrounds and people are not very aware of what institutions are supposed to be, given the fact that we were having a dictatorship, things happen without anything. There were so many problems that we are intuiting, which we inherited. So it is our duty to be bold enough to stand up and recognize those problems and then move on forward. And that is exactly what we are doing. That's what we are doing. And right now there is a program of action which I, we, we, are, we, are, we are working on. There are recommendations. Sally, made. can we have order, please? There's a lot of noise. And us. so that whatever weaknesses that might have been seen, we will deal with them and address them. And maybe some of them will one day come to you here as we progress for you to look at, and then we move forward for a better Gambia. Um, Honorable Member for Upper Fuladu, West. Uh, I withdraw my question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Hi, Excellency, going by the answer you provided, you mentioned uh, the misconduct that was being practiced by the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, during your investigation, do you call all the parties concerned or do you engage the management? Because there are a lot of uh, allegations made against the management that there are serious misconduct and abuse of office. Mm -hmm. In case uh, the management was found wanted, well, what will be your stand? Thank you. Well, you see, when you deal with um matters of institutions and you deal with grievances it is the evidence before you that should be the basic principles of taking a decision it could be on both sides there were certain things that were dealt with and it happens to fall on one side we had to take these right steps right now the uh, director the former director is no longer there She's not found to be wanting as was misrepresented because I, for one, am interested in making sure that we get our institutions right. And having been in a position to be able to take responsibility or something that falls under my purview, I will try as much as possible to do my best based on professional ethics. And everything that was done was there. Now, you must understand also even me, when the process was going on, I was being insulted. <laughs> but you know, I understand. I, am, I understand for the fact that we are emerging from a difficult situation. And when change comes, and you want to put certain things in place, people resist. And when those resistances do come, we are in a reform process. And that reform process that is going on, many people will not want to go in because change Change is a difficult process, and some of them, they are used to the habits that they were used to. I will not go for posting. I have been here. I was the first person to be appointed. 
and therefore I don't have to go decentralization what I cannot go if you don't give me a better house because I don't have this I don't have that and so many other things you can negotiate and we have to give the basic minimum standards that are there but getting to the point that you are going to say it is what I want that needs to be happening is dictatorial and that's, those are the tendencies we have to avoid in managing our institutions and in doing whatever we are doing to move forward so the rules apply where it applies but as I said we have looked at all these questions that are asked and now culminating into evidence-based information that we're going to use to improve our institutions because people come and go, government come and go, but institutions will always remain. And what guides those institutions is those rules, regulations, processes and laws that are in place that every individual that comes to those institutions will inherit to move forward. Honorable Member for Nyamina East. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Madam Vice President, what is your take if I put it to you that the DG has the right to dismiss only those in Category 3, and it is the Board that have the right to dismiss those in Category 2? And if that is the case in that regard, are you committed to take any legal action against the DG as per the law governing the institution? Thank you very much for that question. I wish we knew what processes were undertaken in dealing with this matter. And if we're going to bring in the law and litigate against each other, then we might consider FSEOA QA closed for a very long time. Because you're talking about rights, rights of the institution, rights of the individuals that are within that contestation, and all other procedures that govern the whole institution and its practice and praxis. The categories you are talking about within the framework of the FSQA rules and regulations, which has been used as a basis which was not signed, are the reason why they came. Would you understand that as a civil servant or an employee of an institution, you are not supposed to give information that is not correct, that is not true, to the public to the point that it went to the social media and gave damaging, damaging information on an individual who was trying to implement and apply his or her duty to what is her responsibility. I think um, Gambia, what we need to do is to try to rectify the anomalies. And I think this is a great opportunity to rectify the anomalies. If it is a tit for tat the issue, just like you are calling for those account, uh, 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 the constituency you represent in terms of this case, and if the director or the management also came and they face in court law of court, it will be a different ball game. This government knows it has inherited a lot of institutions that needs to be taken care of, that needs to be put in place. And this is one good example by which we are now taking to consider in terms of all the reforms. Reforms are going on. I guess you all know about that. And these reforms, as they go, we are unpacking and seeing a lot of dynamics unfolding. These dynamics that are unfolding are lessons for us to learn, are lessons for us to follow and build a better Gambia. Not a Gambia where we will be taking each other to the law courts. Then we may not move forward with what we want. So I want to tell you that the due processes were done, the due diligence is were done, and we have interceded in many things that we feel we want to move the organization further rather than create that sort of legal tussle when people are just trying to follow up on procedures to move. 
to yes, air is um, woman. Oh, your, your Excellency, I I stand to be I stand to be corrected, but I personally I appreciate the explanations. But I think I'm not very sure whether the supplementary question that was asked with regards to the Director General, am I right, was actually captured. If probably you could just repeat the supplementary question and then yes, she responded. She she took the she quoted the right relevant issues that were under her purview. That were under her purview, and she responded. And I think there is a lot of correspondence to that effect that she had followed the due diligence and processes to do that. Yes, those that were under her categories, they were she did it. Thank you. What we will do, I think, at the end of maybe this week or early next week, we'll compile the responses and make them available so you can follow it up. Thank you. Um, and also, as by way of reminder, the supplementary questions are limited to seven. And everybody cannot ask a supplementary question. We have to I... divide... We have to divide it amongst ourselves. So please, can you give chance to yeah, but other my honorable members? I don't get the no? benefit of the doubt. My no. question is not answered. I mean, my question is not answered. I ask a very precise question. Um, I ask you. That was why I asked the honorable, um, the High Excellency, the Vice President, that I'm not sure your question was um, was was answered. Yes. And I thought you said yes. I, I never said yes. I am asking the madam... The reason why all of us cannot speak at the same time. We have to listen to each other. Even me, I thought that what the High Excellency said was okay, but not necessarily answering your question, your supplementary question. That was my take. So I, I said repeat your supplementary yes. question. I am simply asking precisely that the DG does not have the right whatsoever, according to the law, to dismiss those in category two. She only have the right to dismiss those in category three. And according to my findings, the DG went ahead and dismissed those in category two. So I am asking whether she is committed to Sorry, take please, legal honorable, action just against ask the a direct question. If you ask a direct question, but if you go in circles, it may be yeah, Maybe confusing. she doesn't understand that is why she is not answering my question. I am simply asking, are you committed to take any legal action against the DD, considering what she has done, dismissing those in category two? Okay, thank you very much. Just cool it. <laughs> we will deal with it and I will give you the answers. As I said earlier, institutions are governed by rules and regulations, bounded by certain acts and policies and procedures and processes that ultimately leads them to make certain decisions. And I said, everything that I read here was bounded by particular provisions of the GO and government orders, and also by the document that is governing the FSQA. Some of these issues that you raised before the DG Act are based on rule books and acts that established this, the institution. So everything that she did with regards to those dismissals were bounded by those rules and regulations. The issue, the second question that you asked, the first question, within the first question you asked, whether the issue of litigation. I said, in this country, what we are trying to do now is to look at our institutions and see how best we can look at the gaps. This was a good example. It was a good learning point for all of us to look at what is there and accept being brave enough to accept some of the lacuna and the gaps and work forward with them rather than going for litigations. I, have remi I, I just want to remind you about that. So whatever the DG did was based on some of the issues, uh, 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 books and the acts of uh, establishing the institution and also the governing instruments on, uh, uh, of government. Honorable nominated member, Jaitin. 
<laughs> Honorable Speaker, thank you. Before I start, I would just like to say I still feel that um, the Honorable Member's question wasn't answered, but I would move to my own question. Um, uh, um, from what I've heard from the... is for you to ask your... Yes, you can follow I'm going up on straight, to my, straight to my question. Mm. Um, from what I've heard from the Minister, from the Honourable Vice President's explanation, mm. these people, they were uh, people made allegation, over 15 people made an allegation against one person. And uh, instead of that person being investigated or put on hold for, let's say, a leave with pay, until these serious allegations that were made against her to be investigated, those people who made these allegations were the ones who were reposted or dismissed. I don't understand the rationale behind uh, that decision. And why, what came out from the investigations of these allegations that were made against the DG? And if, he, if these allegations were false, why was this DG removed from the position and those people who were victimized have their victimization reversed and brought back to their position? Was, is this a mistake in investigation? Who investigated this? Where is the report? Um, thank you very much. I will respond to the questions as you raise them. Three issues. You talked about allegations. 15 people made allegations against one person. That is your question number, uh, your first question. Their letter of petition has brought in a, quite a number of allegations. Mm -hmm. And when that was done, there was a due process put in place. I want to explain to you how institutions work now, so that you know. When the letter came, when it was received, what we did was to institute a commission of inquiry to look into the litigation, and an independent body was recruited without interference in this process. It had the opportunity, it gave them the opportunity to allow each of the parties involved, if we're talking about fundamental freedoms and rights of individuals. You had those who made the allegations and those who was, that the person who was alleged to have involved, that panel allowed both to come up, investigated and interviewed them and asked critical questions and therefore wrote a report which was submitted to the Office of the Vice President. That report was received, and we instructed that the person who is being reported or has the right to respond to the issues raised against her and her senior management. That was done. In every institution, Whatever happens, when there is, this is a procedure, a standard given procedure in all institutions all over the world, and that's what we did. It's not because there are 15 people against one person, therefore, because of their numbers, they are on the right track, or because we want to favor this order. They came with their, with their uh, uh, letter, we, we set up a panel, they investigated, they gave us a report, and we said, the report, the person has the right to respond to the issues raised against her. And that's what we did. She came with her own responses, counter evidences, and it was subjected to further scrutiny. There were options that were brought in that was placed in front of the staff who sought their grievances. And in the discovery of some of those works, there were people who were part of that 15, who were not members, who were already gone 10 years ago. But because this change has happened, and they thought this is an opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to, to try our chance, they came in to join those who were appointed, fully appointed by the institutions. The evidence is there. So the first answer to your question is, both had the right to explain both sides of it. 15, and the individual and her senior management. 
postponed or post reported for they said why was she not uh, why was she was she was uh, what uh, uh, she was dismissed why was the dg uh, removed why was the dg removed as another question you asked the gym dg is not removed if you go by institutional procedures the dg was moved to another institution and another set of people brought in to move on with the institutions. As I said, these are strategies in development paradigms that are used in strengthening institutions and trying to bring in harmony and bring continuity. And these are government civil servants who can be moved when necessary. So there is nothing wrong with that that had happened. We're talking about a human rights-based democracy. And we have to protect all rights as long as they fall within the principles of uh, uh, what is expected. Investigate, we are, uh, what we do in management practice, practice, you apply certain step-by-step -step procedures. We have applied those steps of procedures. We could have told them, now this is what the both sides are saying, go to court and settle them. It is not in the best interest of any good democracy to do so. Especially if it is within the frame of, of an institution in which ways and means can be done to respond to them. And that is what happened. Thank you. Um, Honorable Member for Birkama North. I think my question has been asked by Cover. Honorable Nominated Member. Mm. And we draw. Okay, thank you. Then Fony, <coughs> sorry, Fony Kansala. <coughs> thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker. Hi, Excellency, Madam Vice President. In your response, you made mention, if I got you right, that um, lessons have been learned, and I believe if lessons have been learned, it's both parties. Now, my question is, in your view, looking at the strength of the FSQA staff. Was it a wise move to dismiss the Sorry, that I think that is asking for an opinion. Can you ask a supplementary question All right, to okay. you know, clarify? Yeah, I, I'm still coming to that. Yeah, um, okay, I can remove the word view and, and, and substitute it with um, during the process that this number of staff were dismissed from work, what negative impact did it have on the institution. Thank you very much. This is a very good question. That is why I believe the line of action that was taken was to bring to light the type of image and the type of actions and attitudes of some of our civil servants in the institutions who are supposed to follow the rules and regulations that bind them. The stories they were taking out to the social media, these emails they were sending out, of course, it's not going to give a good light to any country even or to any institution. And therefore, needs to be nipped in the board to make sure that the reforms and the changes we want will go according to conventional practices in institutions. What had happened, you've been following the social media, and this is not only with FSQA, but this is, the, this is the example I'm going to give. Things that are supposed to be internal matters, things that are supposed to have been dealt with institutionally, have gone even before the persons get, and there were even so many actions that were done. It has a negative impact on all institutions all over the world, and there should be zero tolerance to that. 
So therefore, the impact that it has created is why we are now taking action to respond to those things, as I said, the gaps and so on. They are not supposed to share information or organize unacceptable meetings in the office, refusing to take their uh, orders. They were refused, they were refused, they refused to do a lot of things. And even me as the vice president, I was not respected in that process because I was trying to say, please go in, we are responding to you and say we are not going. It has a negative impact. And I don't think any individual who wants to move this country, uh, country forward or institutions even as small as at any level would want that it has a negative impact indeed. And that is what we have to address as a country and as a whole. And the rules and regulations that are supposed to bind that if they were not signed, and that is the basis for which they are coming back, I think I agree in total, in total, that we have to address them and that's what we are doing. You are right. It has a negative impact. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Question number 17 of 2020 by the Honorable Member for Banjul Central again. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Speaker, can Her Excellency, the Vice President, tell this August Assembly if there is any plan to move the Gambia Food Safety and Quality Authority from the Office of the Vice President to its proper line ministry, that is the Ministry of Health? Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Madam Speaker. In general terms, food safety and quality standards universally are multidisciplinary, affecting a wide range of institutions and not limited to the health sector alone. Henceforth, the social determinants of health mostly lies outside the health sector. It is with this context that the National Health Policy 2012 to 2020 promotes intersectoral collaboration and shared partnerships as its guiding principle to achieve the desired policy outcomes for the health sector in which the sector cannot achieve alone. Food safety has been described as protecting food supply chain from microbial, chemical, and physical hazards that may occur during all stages of food production, including growing, harvesting, processing, transporting, retailing, distributing, preparing, storing, and consumption. When food safety systems are well developed, they contribute to improved public health, increased food trade, reduction of poverty, increased food security, and the protection of the environment. Hence the need for the creation of a scientific and regulatory body in line with international best practices and standards, such as the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, of the United States that are independent but clearly interlinked with public health systems. There is an increasing global interest in the safety of foods available for consumption. This interest is heightened when the food is intended for the market both local and export. To address these concerns, national and international strategies have been put in place to provide the requisite information, standards and regulations to ensure that consumers get the best value for health and nutrition. The adoption and implementation of the Food Safety and Quality Act 2011 is expected to reduce the burden of foodborne diseases in the country. The Act provides a basis for the establishment of food safety objectives, requirements and guidance for application to specific sectors of food chain, that is, from farm to work. An assessment of the food safety situation in the Gambia undertaken in 2009 under the auspices of UNIDO, 
through the West Africa Quality Program, found that responsibility for control of food safety was divided between ministries of health, tourism, agriculture, fisheries, local government, and the Gambia Revenue Authority, to the detriment of public health and trade in food products. Within the Ministry of Agriculture, responsibilities were divided between the Department of Animal Health and Production and the Plant Protection Services, while Fisheries Department had responsibility within the Ministry of Fisheries. Within the Ministry of Health, responsibilities were divided between directorates of public health and food standards quality and hygiene enforcement. Controls remained organized on the basis of commodity groups, such as plants, livestock, fish, reflecting functions of government departments rather than being arrangements in terms of the functions and risks to be controlled. It was found that most people considered control to be a question of sampling and testing a product before it passes to the market. However, controls must be applied throughout the supply chain in an integrated system, the farm to fork principle. The legislation in place. At the time, Public Health Act 1990, as amended, Food Act 2005, was found to be insufficient when it came to food safety controls as it had fragmented responsibilities and deficiencies in controls. Variable inspection standards lead to variable results, meaning few effective controls implemented to protect the con consumer health. Whilst the Food Act 2005 provided a good framework for import-export control, the adequate powers to authorize officers, several important functions were, however, not addressed. Among other issues, the primary responsibility of the food business operators for food and safety was not expressed. There was no requirement for food control to be based on science and the principles of risk analysis. There was no principle of transparency. Animal feeds as source of human and animal health hazards were not considered. As a result of these deficiencies, combined with the lack of resources, facilities, and training, the food safety system in the Gambia was in a perilous condition, with few effective controls implemented to protect the consumer's health. There were significant levels of rejections of consignments of ground nuts and fishery products in the export markets, and the weakness of the control system threatened export markets access. Given the country's significant dependence on imported food, the weaknesses in relation to Broader inspection functions were especially worrying. The assessment concluded that the country was subject to a significant risk of exposure to agents harmful to animals, plants, and human health, and addressing the deficiencies at a system level was a matter of national importance and urgency. It was therefore, with this background information, it was therefore recommended that the government of the Gambia promulgated a new food act to create a unitary food safety authority. In view of the national strategic importance of ensuring effective food safety controls and the function of the authority as a high profile and first tier regulator in the national and international spotlight. It will report to the Vice President, it's not to ISATR, but to the Vice President's office. I happen to be there now. <laughs> the creation of a food safety authority will allow government for the first time to determine a budget for food safety and ensure regulatory standards that cuts across all the parties mentioned earlier. It was recommended 
to transfer to this authority, i.e. the FSQA, the responsibility for implementation of food safety controls from the following ministries and departments as expressed within Section 15 of the Food Safety Act 2005. Ministry of Health, Director of Pub Directorate of Public Health, Director of Food Standards, Quality and Hygiene Enforcement, Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Health and Production Services, Pest Protection Services, Ministry of Fisheries, Water Resources and National Assembly. Stems. Department of uh, 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 Department of Fisheries, Ministry of Tourism, Gambia Tourism Authority, Ministry of Local Government, Local Government Authorities. The Food Safety and Quality Act number 7 of 2011 established the Food Safety and Quality Authority of the Gambia and the attendant structures such as A, Scientific Committee, B, Food Control Advisory Committee, C, Stakeholder Consultative Forum. Honorable Speaker, thank you very much. This is what I have. Yes, thank you very much. Just take the supplementaries. But the, Madam Speaker, the please honorable grab the... member. Sorry, the honorable member who posed the original question has a right to ask two supplementaries, and then we will take the additional five from the remaining. So, Honorable... Um, yes, I have one supplementary question. Yes. Your Excellency, um, uh, we all know that the Health Ministry has so many experts concerning the work of food and safety. Um, um, now, do, um, do, you want, um, do you want to tell me that your office can perform more than the Minister of Health concerning food and safety? Oh. <laughs> Lancy, before we proceed to yes. that, please may I appeal to honorable members. We are all guided by our standing orders. Let's try adhering to, to, to them. Now see our clause 38. This is just my way of observation. I have been observing since Thank yesterday. Thank you very much. Clause 38 deals with questions. Okay. May I respond to your Sorry, questions? Sorry, no, honor, your, your Excellency, please, Sorry. can you just allow me? I want mm. to address some few issues. And it deals with the admissibility of questions. There's a whole lot of rules to be adhered to. Let's try to ensure that we stick to those ones. And then you go on to for, for further to 43. 43 deals specifically with supplementary questions. The purpose is to elucidate an oral answer. I mean, there are certain things that are not allowed according to the standing orders that we passed in this assembly. Look at, for instance, 43.3, um, the time taken to ask a supplementary question shall be no longer than one minute and an answer to a supplementary question shall be no longer than two minutes. The period may be extended to at the discretion of the speaker. A supplementary question shall not be in order if it introduces matters not included in the original question and the answers provided. For the avoidance of doubt, a supplementary question is within remit shall be determined on answering by Vice President, Minister or Member answering the question on behalf of the authority. So let us please try and look at the relevant clauses of the, of the standing order. So we'll all be in order. Honorable Speaker, Thank is there you. any problem with my correction? No, no. Pardon? No. No, ah, okay, no, okay. no, there is no problem. No problem. Thank you. Actually, the Honorable Member for Bangul South, I was just addressing a general perception so that we can all be guided. Mm. 
observe you said you have... I just observed something. Sorry, pardon. I just... No, 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 no. I've not given. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he posed he posed a supplementary question. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I have noted the number of minutes I will have to respond to each questions. Yes. Thank you very much. I just want to explain to you that Ministry of Health is one player in this whole process. It is not only about health. It is not about health. You remember, originally, if you read the, uh, look at the question, uh, the, the paper, it is telling you how this issue evolved until it came to be put under a high oversight under the office of the vice president. Because there are different actors who are supposed to be playing. You have agriculture, you have health, you have fisheries, you have consumers, you have other things. And the various variables that were put in that study of UNIDO and all other institutions in the country came to agree that the Gambia is a groundnut exporting country. And it also produces all the things. And the issue of quality is being thought of. A lot of issues were brought in that is not under the purview of health. So it was important to have an overarching body, which is the FSQA, to be able to work with all these thematics, bringing in the people, working, and there is a scientific officer. It's not everybody who can be there as FSQA. You have to be a scientist because it has to deal with a lot of issues. Maybe if you are ready, you can meet us. We can tell you how this evolved so that you understand better. Thank you. Honorable members, the, the second question is still on quality control, and I would like to give an opportunity to those honorable members who did not ask supplementary questions on the previous question touching on quality control. So please, honorable member for Sarah Kundal. Honorable Speaker, the question is about oversight institution. But Honorable Speaker, wouldn't the Honorable Vice President consider the actual nature and characteristic of this institution as a public enterprise with a board we should actually have that autonomy to be able to function as a public enterprise. Isn't the emphasis, the establishment of this institution as an autonomous institution, functioning according to the act? Thank you very much. Indeed, that is what is intended. And that's what we are working towards. And that was the reason why all the other institutions we are brought together that have implication and they are taking an oversight responsibility as a office of the president is just to give it the importance and support that it needs to work towards that. There is a lot of plan in place for it to work and that these are part of the reforms that we are, we are, we are dealing with. And it will, it, it will be taken note uh, not, not, uh, on board. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Honorable Member for Upper Salum. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker. The um, Honorable Vice President earlier was, um, in her answer, refer, was referring to FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. Um, uh, and uh, this institution actually is under the Department of Human Health and Human Services, which is equivalent to the Minister of Health we have here. So I was just trying to understand uh, really what she was trying to allude to, uh, because the main question really was saying why can this institution be under the Minister of Health? And the example she was given under the FDA, they are already under the Minister of Health in the United States. So I re really want to get a clarification of exactly what she was trying to allude to. Thank you. Thank you. You see, when you do literature review, when... <laughs> When you want to effect reforms and you want to do refractory review, you read a lot of documentation and you look at different practices all over the world. You try to do that analysis based on best practices and you try to quote certain models, models that will help you come with an, uh, with, with an approach that will suit your context. These are references made to standards 
and references made to initiatives that are in other existing places, which are actually which has very wide recognition and appreciation. And as part of the literature review, you have to also quote where you get your information from. <laughs> so when we say FDA, we talk about UNIDO, we talk about other institutions. These are all relevant institutions under this particular subject matter that have been known to be performing well and have got the standards and you want to look at what they are doing that you want to do and adapt it to your situation. That is why. And to make it clear, the Ministry of Health has a critical role to play, but all other sectors that I mentioned also equally have critical roles to play. There is an intersection and interlinkage and also responding to different epidemiological, clinical, social, economic, human, and international ramifications that governs all these issues, which is not under the purview of the health alone. It is a multifaceted, a multidisciplinary oversight responsibility that needs to be given a high recognition for us to be able to move forward to the next level. That is it. It's not only Ministry of Health. Maybe if you want, we can give you the documentation and the studies that were conducted that will help you to understand more because you know it come to agriculture. Maybe sometimes aflatoxin is a big problem for our products because we do not have any scientific lab that is going to come and assess even from the beginning before we plant it. We do not have the necessary conditions that need to be in place. When we export food, there is what we call ISO 9000. Are we fit for this? Where does it go? It goes to Dakar and other places. All this is money. So to move the country forward and to work towards autonomy and independence of certain things and to cut costs, this government is particularly interested in looking at how do we empower in our institutions, our bodies that are responsible for laws, for regulations, for engagement with other aspects to be able to work towards sustainability. So that is why these are best practices that are going on and to let, tell you to, uh, uh, to be able to deal with matters because it has the ramifications. It's not only about health. You have different implications like I listed for you. Thank you. Honorable member for Opanyomi. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for giving me the floor. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask the Madam Vice President, what are you doing in terms of coordination and the implementation of, of the programs of FSQA in relation to the question they ask you, what are your plans? Probably people are not much satisfied yes. the way the institution is, you know, carry on their responsibilities as far as our expectation is concerned. Yes. What are you doing exactly in terms of your, your coordination? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's uh, a point, point of order. Uh, I'm writing on um, um, clause 43 on the supplementary questions. Yeah, 43 one um, supplementary questions may be put for the purpose of elucidating an oral answer and if you look at the answer the vice president actually gave it has no relation to what he is asking <laughs> there's no there's no relation there, there's some clarification that he needs yes yes yes, yes. yes. i yes. think there is yes i read the um, yes i read the clause earlier on but i think his yes. question has yes. some yes. Yes. connection. Yes. May I go? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just want to assure you that your question is very good, very relevant, and very fundamental for this type of responsibility. Madam Speaker, I think the Honorable Member have to withdraw his point of order. <laughs> okay, okay, Honorable, there, I withdraw it. There, there is no need for it because I've already overruled him. So. <laughs> Uh, it is important for the fact that you are now amalgamating different entities who were standing in isolation, doing everybody doing their business with the belief that we are the right institution. And as a result, some are left because 
there were less emphasis on them, or they were taken for granted, or the capacity was not there for people to understand these interlinkages. And a study has, an assessment has resulted in understanding the intersectionality of all these issues, and have come up with a best practice recommendation that they have a body, uh, 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 a body that has an oversight responsibility in coordinating, organizing, and facilitating these bodies to come up with, to respond to some of the gaps and the problems that have been identified to improve the situation. That is the FSQA. The FSQA will be coordinating, organizing, working with all the institutions in the country that I have mentioned here to apply some of the standards, procedures, and all the things that are needed in order for us to achieve the objective. The institution is going through a reform, and I want to tell you, as I earlier alluded to, we are taking account of all these things so that we get it right. And we are supporting them for them to get it right because when you are putting an institution towards autonomy, there must be an oversight responsibility. There must be a responsible institution that is going to take that high level policy decision to guide the process so that it goes through the standards. Because we are not isolated, we are part of the global development order. And our produce in agriculture does not stop in the Gambia. Our animals do not only, are not bred in the Gambia alone. We also have other aspects of health. We are in COVID, for example, right now. It's not everything that we are using here is from Gambia. And so many other things related. So we need an effective coordination, and that is what FSQA is doing. And we are working towards that, and we are strengthening it. This crisis also has opened everything. I had a discussion with the, uh, with the management just last week. And we are coming with a roadmap. A lot of assessments are, are going on. A lot of efforts are going on so that we learn from these gaps and move forward, just like all other institutions. These are reform processes that will take time, but we are moving towards the right direction. And that is what we are doing. You know, we are emerging from a very difficult situation, and people seem to be impatient, to the point that following due processes and procedures, sometimes we want to scale, jump it. We will fail if we do that. We have to allow processes to go on. We have to allow movements of the, to, to go from one logical step to another. The whole value chain of anything you think of has to be taken in place so that we move. That's what we are doing. Thank you. It's a relevant question. Thank you. Again, by, by way of reminder, the, the response should take not more than two uh, okay. minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, honorable member for um, Nyanija, Iliasa is not here. Thank, Thank you very much, honorable speaker. So. Thank you very much, honorable speaker. Honorable speaker, the justification and the need for having an authority of this nature cannot be overemphasized. Honorable speaker, can the can High Excellency the Vice President inform this, inform this August Assembly the marked difference between having the authority and what previously existed? Thank you. Okay. What previously it appears existed? to be a new question. Um, no. I would accept a clarification between A and B based on an answer, but to bring in completely new elements, I will rule that one out. If you want to ask another supplementary question, you are at liberty, but not definitely this one. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There is nothing new in it. Uh, actually, my question is something previously existed. That's why the, this question came. There was an authority or a director under the Ministry of Health responsible for this. Mm -hmm. Now there is an authority under the Office of the Vice President responsible for food and food services handling and whatever. That is in the Act. So now I am asking, as per the question, what are the differences that existed before and now with Thank regards you. to food handling, food inspection and testing yes. and so on? Yes, uh, I have um, uh, in my... Thank you very much. It's a relevant question. This study has identified that different entities were acting separately and they were all accountable to themselves and to different bodies. But if you look at it, it is the country. 
And the issues that this paper is addressing is about what we call harmony, unity of purpose and direction. Focus on harmony to create a track towards autonomy of making sure that issues that affect the country under these purviews are well coordinated and put together so that we will be able to comp compete effectively, efficiently, and work e uh, effectively, and also consolidate on leveraging resources to the different sectors. Because when people are standing as is isolations, they are all competing for one resource, and therefore you, you, you know the dynamics that do unfold. So I think our role here as Office of the Vice President is to have an oversight responsibility in helping to support the FSQA work towards that process and achieve what we want. They're working towards autonomy, but we have to fulfill certain conditions. It's just like when you have a university, you introduce a degree program, you must have oversight responsibility of, a, of an institution, either within or outside, to be able to guide the process and also to harmonize all the competing interests. That's what we are doing. And I think it is towards the right direction. It is what we should go in for because the world is a competitive market. And if we cannot Thank compete, okay, nothing is going to work for yes. us. Um, nominated member, Honorable Deyasin, please. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, your Excellency, in all your statements, you know that you are talking about the Gambia and the over and the other countries. But what, is, what about the Gambia within ourselves? Are you, are you making any sensitization? Because in all your, your answers that you made, I did not hear anything about sensitization, which is so key. Even if you go to the shops to buy things and you talk about the, the uh, FSQA, they will not even know what it is. And sometimes it creates some problem. Example, the bread they, buy, you, they, they, they sell, they don't handle it properly. So in this, I, is there any mechanism of this sensitization to let the Gambians know? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think um, that's a very good question for the fact that we are now faced with COVID and we are now beginning to be aware of hygiene. We are now beginning to be aware of the fact that we have to observe certain things. And when it comes to food that we eat, we have to be more concerned about how it is handled. Yes, that, is, that falls under the purview of the FSQA, working with the relevant institutions. I think there is need for more sensitization in almost everything that we are doing now. I think this is the era and the period that sensitization and awareness creation on matters relating to these matters you have raised, like bread, like food, like restaurants, like hotels, like everywhere, even among ourselves, for us to handle that. And the awareness may not be there as such, and I agree with you that we have to do more sensitization and that we will make sure that the institutions working under the FSQA and those that it is collaborating will take note. It was a cause of concern that we raised also at different levels and I will take it on board. It's a very key issue. We have a population that may not be able to read these things, unquote, but they understand all the languages. And when you talk about social mobilization and advocacy, sensitization, you need to use the language, you need the strategies that people are understanding that are culturally relevant. I will, we, will, we will take it on board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last question, or the supplementary question, is by Jul North. One minute, as per the standing order. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Yes, I will abide by that. Uh, Honorable, uh, Honorable, Your Excellency Vice President, uh, the question is uh, that uh, are there any plans afoot to move FSQA to the Minister of Health. And I would agree with you that FSQA has a cross-cutting mandate. It is multi-sectoral. It's not only uh, health, and it's not only food. Feed is also included. It's not only food that is consumed consume here, but also export, as you have said, said uh, the, the aflatoxin. But the reason, I think, is that effectiveness of the institution. Are you considering as the overarching, because the reason why it has been moved there is because of your overarching position. Mm -hmm. And for your information, I was very much part of that process that I led know. to the formation of, I was working for UNIDO as an expert for, two, for more than two years. And we, we, but we, we were the ones who were responsible. We, I was the communication expert. Uh, so I know the, the reasoning, the thinking. But the, the situation is that, the issue is that 
there are challenges in terms of the institution. You have the problems with food, diabetes in the country, hypertension. And the, the other partners are not very much working in, in concert. Are you, I've as a gone minister, beyond your as a minister, okay, as a minister I are want you considering? Just ask a direct question. Thank you, thank you very much. The preamble minister, was long. As a line minister, thank you very much. Are you considering conducting a review of the whole process mm -hmm. so that all the actors exactly. will be part of the process? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, as I told you, we have a plan going on. And there is a multi-sectoral uh, committee that is put in place, reviewing and then assessing and looking at what are the gaps so that we move forward. Remember, there were a lot of lap lapses and gaps, and institutions have not been very, very effective. It is only when you engage with institutions that you know that there are serious, serious lapses, which I'm sure you as members of the subcommittees are beginning to see. It is something that is inherited. And to deal with it, we have to be ready to engage constructively and review, review and review, assessments and assessments, and coming out with logical strategies to be able to achieve the objectives. There are inherently, there are a lot of information that is good, but the implementation, the operationalization, and putting it into context are some of the challenges, and those are the things we are addressing. So I urge all of us to be patient in doing all these things so that we move forward. We'll get there. We are getting there also with your support. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. We've exhausted our seven supplementary questions. And as I indicated earlier on, Office of the Vice President, they're not yet ready with the June questions. We will come next week, Wednesday. So we cannot take question number 82, Birkama Sal. Um, and Banyul North, question 83. 84 is Kiang East. We'll take them next week. So we'll proceed. Clark, thank, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Question for oral answers continues. The Honourable Minister for Defence. Thank you very much. Um, questions, questions for which due notices were given to Honourable Minister for Defence by Honourable Members for oral reply. Question number, number 8 of 2020, Honourable Member for Birkama North. 20, um, number eight. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Speaker, in a follow-up to my parliamentary question on the issue of relocating the firing range at Brikama, Jamisa, due to the threat it poses to the community. The then Vice President conveyed a meeting in our office involving the Council of Elders of Bikama, the Army, Nuns of Bikama, and the Fiscal Planning. Can the Honorable Minister for Defense inform this assembly the location of the identified land and how far the Army has gone with the said decision or plans to locate the firing range. Honorable Speaker, I wish to inform this August Assembly that the services of experts from the British Army were engaged and they have done some feasibility studies in some areas within the countryside for possible relocation of the range. This process is ongoing and we expect it to be completed in due course. Honorable Speaker, my ministry, in collaboration with the Gambia Armed Forces, continues to capacitate the members of the Gambia Armed Forces in line with international best practices. Key among the priority area is to meet the growing demand for health care delivery to the members of the Armed Forces, their families, and by extension, the general public. Honorable Speaker, 
Honorable members, we intend to build a military hospital at the Lance Corporal Bojang Memorial Range in Birkama once a new site is identified for the location of the range. We have no intention to re relinquish this property, but to protect it for the use by the Gambia Armed Forces Medical Services. This, as you know, honorable speaker, honorable members, will not only serve the armed forces, but will also serve the community of Birkama and the general public at large. I beg to move, honorable speaker. Thank you, honorable members. So, we have supplementary questions from honorable members. Birkama North, you have supplementary questions? Yes, to be specific. We intend to build a military hospital once a new site is identified. To this point, are you telling me that a new site is yet to be identified? Honorable member, as I just alluded to a minute ago, the team is working on, they have got several sites, and now we're coming to decisions on where to select. So please bear with us, and uh, as soon as it's done, we, we, will, we will inform you accordingly. You can have another one, an additional supplementary. And again, to be precise, is it that a site has not yet been identified? If not, how soon do you expect the site to be identified? Thank you, Honorable. Uh, as I said, there are several locations that are in mind and on site. Keeping in view of the importance of where that ring is to be located, several options were forwarded to my ministry, and we are going to make a decision, and very soon, Honorable Member, we'll get back to you. I promise it wouldn't be long, we'll get back some information to you. Um. Thank you very much. Wuli East. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, my question is uh, whether there is a buffer between the perimeter fence of the range and the residence nearby. Uh, because there is no buffer, the possibility of accidents occurring is there. Is there any buffer or is there any plan to create a buffer between the residents and the fence itself? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The location of that range we used when we were in 1984 at Yundum, we realized that that location needed some demarcation. And we have identified what they call the limit of exploitation in the armed forces, the LOEs, where we know the range of a particular bullet when you fire going to Casa Kunda or some of the neighboring, neighboring villages. We have now got the British experts to give us all the information we needed because of their experience in ranges and their locations with respect of the velocity of ammunition being fired at that particular range. That's why in those days, when you miss your target, you will be jokingly said that, oh, your round has gone to Casa Kunda. But we now realize the, the seriousness, and uh, we're working on it very closely. We know where the bullets go to, and when we get to do the firing, we have put in a mechanism for the troops to go in the area to sensitize the villages in the, in the area and the, the farmers indi indicate to them whether there is a firing life exercise or there are internal security training going on. So yes, we have identified the perimeter and now the report is, is already there and we will, we will make sure that people stay away and, and not, be, not be hurt. Honorable Minister, you have two minutes to respond to the questions. Honorable Member for Combo East, one minute. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. As the response indicated by the Honorable Minister, is there any specific time frame for the feasibility studies? Thank you. 
I will get back as soon as possible with the experts and I'll pro provide that information as soon as possible. Honorable Member for Busumbala. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Minister, um, when the uh, range of Brikama was established, I know there was no intention to relocate it. But there are issues that combine to it now that is claim for relocation. Remember, you have one minute to ask your question. Then you break so, me for 30 seconds. And um, are you putting into consideration of the issues that prompted for the move, relocation of range from Brikama to another place to avoid another relocation, relocation of range on, of anywhere you want to put it right now? The issues, are you putting them into consideration? Yeah, thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, that is in consideration. That's why we have experts. We just didn't go and do it ourselves. We have people who are quite au fait, like our range in Farafenye Palodi or something. We make sure that, yes, that is, is, is put into consideration. Very much, Honorable Member for Funi Brefet. Honorable Speaker, I would like to uh, withdraw my question. It was adequately dealt with. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, I would like to ask the Honorable Minister, since this is going to be a training, why do they use life bullets instead of rubber? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, sometimes in the armed forces, we do what they call life firing exercise. We have to be realistic. We have to, this is business. That's why defense and security is not, is not, um, so it's something very sensitive and something which is so is part of our mandate, the armed forces, that in some areas you do some life exercises. Because when, God forbid, you engage into battle, there will be no blank rounds. It's going to be life rounds. So it is part of the CDS's training directives that annually some troops will be identified to do some life firing exercise. That's, that's just the way it, it happens. Sorry, Deputy Speaker. Yeah, my, my. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for giving me the floor. Madam Speaker, the Minister said feasibility study is going on. Which of the areas in the Gambia that this feasibility study captured? Honorable, when I took over as a Minister of Defense, I found that the British Army was engaged and they have done some exercises with the Gambia Armed Forces, and they have identified several areas in different regions. As I said, I will now be in the process of studying and going into details to see what, what options among the areas in the country they've got. I have not laid my hands on the, on the project, on the feasibility study, but I know the British Army training came here, did exercise with our Armed Forces, and they were tasked to, to look for areas. And as soon as possible, being the chair of the Defense and Security Committee, I promise you that I will get back that information as soon as possible. Sorry, Honorable, we've exhausted our seven questions, supplementary questions for this particular question. But the Honorable Minister has additional questions. Maybe you may wish if they are linked somehow. Um, Question number 141 of 2020, that's the June session by the Honorable Member for Jimara. Jimara. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker Ma. Um, Honorable Speaker, can the Honorable Minister for Defense tell this August Assembly whether there are any joint security agreement signed between the Republic of the Gambia and the Republic of Senegal? And if so, can the said agreement be provided to this August Assembly? Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, National Assembly, before delving into the subject matter, please allow me to thank you for inviting me to answer questions to members of this August body. This clearly indicates that democracy is steadily growing, and this is what all Gambians have been yearning for, and it must be jealously guarded. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, 
It is public knowledge that the Gambia and Senegal signed a series of defense and security agreements and memorandum of understanding since independence. This is so given the fact that Senegal and the Gambia are condemned by destiny to be neighbors, and it is not our choosing, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's. Equally considering the geographical proximity of the Gambia and Senegal, and very close and strategic nature of our relationship between the two countries, it will not be out of place to have cooperative frameworks in place that will have the effect and potential of bringing the two countries much closer. Honorable members, as you may be aware, no single nation, no matter how powerful, has monopoly of power and the wherewithal to provide total security to her people. Without, of course, for people without strong partnership with her neighbors, premise on mutual respect, the rule of law, especially in the fight against terrorism and transnational crimes. Essentially, therefore, nations enter into agreements to better protect her citizens and national interests. The defense and security agreements that the Gambia had with Senegal are basically intended to achieve that objective, honorable members. They are mutually beneficial agreements and not in any way an attempt to surrender the sovereignty of the Gambia as often wrongly portrayed by some quarters. It is within this framework of these agreements that Senegal gave access to Gambian Armed Forces training slots to come to their prestigious military training. As a result, they have trained 300 personnel of the new Presidential Guard. Therefore, the agreements will only help to cement the already very cordial relationship between the governments and militaries of the two countries. Honorable Speaker, bilateral and multilateral agreements are often based on collective bargaining which does not confer advantage to anybody. Usually trade-offs in the overall interests of nations are considered. Madam Speaker, it is prudent to inform this August body that the latest agreement on defense and security cooperation between the government of the Republic of the Gambia and the government of the Republic of Senegal was signed on 4th March 2017. 4th March 2017 in Dakar during the first Senegalo-Gambian Presidential Council. In order to operationalize, operationalize the agreement, a protocol called the Protocol on Operational Agreements for the Implementation of the Right to Cross-Border Hot Pursuit and Joint or Combined Patrols was signed on 12 September 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Um, I never heard of a Gambian security entering Senegal, shooting a Senegalese. But then you are aware, and your office is aware, some back of three months, one can say three months back, it happened in URR, where a Senegal security enter in the Gambia, shoot a Gambian and take that Gambian to Senegal. No, um, Honorable, I think that is outside the no, purview no, of the question. No, I, what I was expecting was for you to ask your, the second leg of your question, if so, can the said agreement be provided to the Assembly? It's that one. No, I'm, I I'm coming understand. to that question. I have two questions. Well, now. but this, the, the issue of shooting is not part of this. But you this asked is, for a security. This is the reason why I asked for this question. Uh, well, you should this have been specific. <laughs> you should have been very specific then, and we would have answered it. But apparently, that's not it. Honorable Minister, um, how soon will we get the agreement, please? Honorable member, I think that can happen. Uh, my team is here. We will, we will provide it uh, momentarily. I think before the end of the day, you can have it. Is that right? Yeah. So by the end of the day, inshallah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes. Um, Sarah Kunda, yes, because I could not get all to the proof. Honorable Speaker, according to the Honorable Minister, there is uh, an agreement signed on the 4th of March, 2017, and a protocol on the 12th of September, 2018. Have those instruments been ratified? And if not, would the Minister tell this Assembly whether it is being enforced? Thank you, Honorable Member. When we left Dakar in the second Senegalo-Gambian 
presidential commission. It was agreement that the technicians will come together and work out the modalities, modalities before it comes here. That's when the COVID-19 hit. Excellency is not yet ratified. The technicians have not even come together to, to agree on a modus operandi. Yes, um, thank you. Opa Fuladu. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, section 79, uh, 1A of the Constitution says that the President shall be responsible for the conduct of relations with other states and international organizations. But Section 2 went further to say the Gambia shall not, Section 2A, the Gambia shall not enter into, uh, into any engagement with any other country you know, which causes it to lose its sovereignty you know, without the matter first being not put to a referendum and passed by a majority or be, may be prescribed to an act of national assembly. Section B says that be, uh, the Gambia shall not become you know, a member of any international organization you know, unless you know, the national assembly is satisfied that it's in the interest of the Gambia and the membership you know, does not derivate our sovereignty, its sovereignty. The minister is informing us uh, that, uh, and according to him in a press brief, that Number one. I also have to be fair to everybody. You, see, you could have just referred to the relevant section and then go ahead with your waiting. question. I'm but if the, I'm the reading trying. will take part, take part of your one minute. I am waiting the one minute now, and I'm still, I'm, I'm timing myself. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, the minister did mention in the press brief, you know, after an insurgency, you know, into our territory, that the, there is an agreement between the Gambia and Senegal. That's why Senegal is supposed to do, you know, was able to do that. But this particular agreement you know, is not ratified by national, the National Assembly, and therefore the, uh, the re, there was no resolution of how to establish the process of you know, these engagements. Can the Minister now shed light on these issues? Sorry, Honourable Member. What is your question? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't understand your question. I thought the Honourable Minister did indicate here I stand to be corrected that the agreement has been signed but not yet ratified. They're working on a framework and then it will be brought to the National Assembly. Yes, but is, that again, is, well, is that correct or not? Yes. I know that, that, was, is, the, that, no, that was the response given to the question, I think, and, um, posed by the Honorable Member for Sarah Kunda. Yes, I understand very well. That's why, you know, in my follow up question, I'm reminding the Minister you know, of the, you know, the, the relevant provisions on the implementation of you know, uh, treaties or agreements. Because according to him, it's because of this agreement, that's why a certain practice was allowed. So I'm just asking him, you know, if this agreement is not, and it's not ratified by parliament, then you know, why was it allowed not to take place? Thank you. Honorable, what, what I've just said is there were a series of agreements since 1965, before all of us were here. We are now trying to put the house in order. There were lapses and issues, and uh, we're trying to fix it. And this is not here, fix it. We're not ready yet. We will get to the defense and select committee, select committee on defense and security. And what we need to talk to you, whatever, is left to you to bring it to the plenary or not. There are certain things I cannot, I cannot divulge here. Please. I know we have a very strong defense committee, so the team is working very hard. <laughs> Yes, um, Honourable Nominated Member, Yakumba. Thank you. Honourable Minister, since we are yet to have the agreement, I just want to ask, is there any provision in this agreement that allows the Senegalese forces to enter Gambia, arrest or take any action um, on Gambian citizens? Is there any provision and can you please provide that provision? Is there anything in these agreements? Thank you, Honorable. I think that um, I don't want to jump the gun. It looks like there's a question that, that, that will answer that. So uh, for your information, there is a question that will, will automatically answer your question. So I don't want to do justice to that question. I think you will, please. Um, Wooly, Wooly East, Honorable Member. But please be very careful with your, I can anticipate you. <laughs> no, no, my questions are very short. Honorable uh, Speaker, 
the Senegalese troops that are stationed at Buyang, are they under any pact that is signed between the Gambia and Senegal? Thank you. Honorable member, as far as I know, that team is part of ECOMIC. ECOMIC was an agreement by presidents of West Africa and ECOWAS, and I don't do much with them other than to find out what they're doing and to, to pay my compliments to them because their constitutional mandates are different from the armed forces. But they are not, there's not part of agreement between Gambia and Senegal that dealt with when we needed ECOMIC to come here during the, the crisis. That is part of that. Maybe the Defense Select Committee, when we discuss that, can ask us to come to the, to the, to the plenary and explain. Thank you. We can take one additional supplementary question. No? OK, then I take it. We move on then to the next question, which is question number 142 by the Honorable Member for Kiang East. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, can the Honorable Minister for Defense explain to this August Assembly what the hot pursuit pact uh, finalized in Senegal is all about? And can he share this pact with the August Assembly? Honorable Speaker, in addressing question two, I would like to inform this August body that hot pursuit is a military term which means going after individuals being pursued for unlawful infringement across national borders. It is a very sensitive issue because without an agreement to that effect, chasing individuals across national borders will amount to violation of that country's national territorial integrity. The terms of the hot pursuit agreement gave parties equal rights under the framework. The condition for cross-border hot pursuit agreements are as follows. The defense and security forces of the pursuing state may, without any prior authorization, pursue an individual or group of individuals involved in activities that can be qualified as crime or violation, especially subversive activities or illicit trafficking into the territory of the state of refuge based on the following conditions. Any hot pursuit operation shall be communicated to the state of refuge when crossing the border becomes unavoidable. In emergency cases, the hot pursuit shall be communicated as soon as the border is crossed. The defense and security forces of the pursuing state may use all communication means, including the pre-established channels between the two operating staff commands or the attached military units on both sides of the border to inform the defense and security forces of the state of refuge. Once notified, the state of refuge shall inform its different local entities and provide assistance to the defense and security forces of the state of refuge. The defense and security forces of the pursuing state shall easily identifiable by defense and security forces to the state of refuge. Any use of weapons by the pursuing state officials shall be controlled and limited to the means strictly necessary for the restraint of the individual or group of individuals pursued to minimize any collateral damage in the territory of the state of refuge. All hot pursuits shall take into consideration the populated and sensitive areas in the refuge state to avoid collateral damages. Beyond five, five kilometers, honorable members, the pursuit becomes a joint operation between the defense and security forces of both states. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, the cross-border hot pursuit was signed on 12 September 2018, Dakar. However, what is lacking is how the commanders could operationalize the agreement by working out the modalities and establish communication channels among our security forces. Equally, it is essential to inform this august body that during the second Senegalo-Gambian Presidential Council held in Dakar, on 11th March 2020, the Joint Military and Security Commission was tasked to expedite the modalities on the conduct of cross-border hot pursuit, joint patrols, and conduct of joint training and exercises. However, the process was hampered by the outbreak 
of COVID-19. Honorable Speaker, I beg to move. All right. Um, thank you, Honorable Speaker, again for the uh, second supplementary question. Uh, could the Honorable Minister, I, I am I'm asking this question because of the incident that happened in Garawal Kuta earlier this year. Um, and I want to, I want the Honorable Minister to inform this, uh, this August Assembly whether this uh, hot pursuit involves the use of uh, lethal force or the use of weapons, even though the, the alleged criminal poses no threat to the security forces. Thank you, Honorable. Of course, I was not there to determine whether they pose threat or not. I know that I went with my team all the way to the house of that gentleman at Garawal Kuta a few weeks ago, and uh, we are finalizing our diplomatic engagements, and we will inform the Defense and Select Committee and this assembly on the final findings. I went there with a the team all the way to his house, took pictures, and did everything, and the reports are, are going to reveal um, what went wrong, and uh, we've always Engage. We've already engaged the Senegalese embassy. We've engaged the chief of defense staff. He met with our chief of defense staff at the border in Farafenye about three days ago. All this, we're trying to get things to take shape. So please bear with us. We'll get back to you on that. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Honorable Minister, this hot, uh, hot pursuit pact is a marriage between two countries, Gambia and Senegal. What are the grounds for divorce? Thank you. Honorable Member, the ground for divorce. So you are still trying to show me that you are a runaway teacher. Can you please ask the question? I, I don't understand what you mean. Thank you. Um, it's an agreement between Gambia and Senegal. What are the grounds for Gambia to pull out? Thank you. Well, I think that answer will be, honorable member, beyond my terms of reference and my, as a minister, I think that is, um, I, I, cannot, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Loa Nyomi. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The hot pursuit philosophy or pact to the understanding of the laymen, the people... You have one minute to ask your question. Is to, it's not very satisfactory. This is why that man was asking for the grounds to divorce because people are not satisfied with the attitude, the profession of the army. Thank you. Actually, honorable member, uh, honorable minister, that was not a question. It was not a supplementary question. It was a statement that the honorable member was making. Unless you want to ask a supplementary question, otherwise we'll rule out that statement. Thank you. What have you done about it since? Because your visit to that place is very late, given the fact that it happened months, and then you were just going there yesterday. Thank you, Honorable. Um, if what you would call me going there yesterday, that's fine, but it wasn't yesterday. There were, there were me me mechanisms that was applied. We have commissioners of different services in that part of URR. When something happened there, the first line of reaction and first line of knowing what's going on, and uh, as I said, there were discussions behind the scenes, both diplomatic and with the armed forces. And uh, my going there was just trying to do my routine checks as a Minister of Defense World, not, not specifically to go for that reason. But please, it's the decision of Gambians, what they want to divorce or what they want to keep. It's not for me to say. Eventually, when it gets to that level, Gambians will decide what they want, Honorable Member. 
Thank you. Fony, Bintan Karanlai, Honorable. Thank you, Honorable Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister, you mentioned that both parties can end up five kilometers into their territories. Compare uh, the size of the Senegal and Gambia. Gambia, from Senegal to Gambia, some areas five kilometers are deep into the Gambia. And from Senegal, to, from Gambia to Senegal, five kilometers is very, very, it's a minimal place. So, do you think this is compromising the sovereignty of, of, the, of the country? It, it is compromising the sovereignty. Are you asking for the Honorable Minister's opinion, or do you want clarification? On no, I want clarification. Uh, good. Then you reframe your question, because you ask, do you think, or what do you think? OK, is it not compromising our sovereignty? Thank you, Honorable Member. This is why you've just been informed that commanders on the ground will come together and a joint decision is made. What is the interest of Gambia will be protected and will be made when that time comes. So I don't want to preempt. I mean, the agreements are on, but the, the commanders have to come and agree or to disagree. So five kilometer, give or take, they have to sit and talk about it. This is the, the Thank you, Honorable Member for Serekunda. Uh, Honorable Speaker, the Honorable Minister has mentioned an agreement of 12 September 2018. Uh, would we then uh, conclude that uh, this instrument governing hot pursuit has actually not been ratified and is yet uh, to be enforced uh, legally? Honorable Member, that agreement was signed at the level of the government, and then it is subject to the commanders coming on the ground to work out the way to be carried out, ways we've not come to that stage, then COVID-19 hit. So it's not, yet, it's not yet in place. As I said, there were previous agreements since the 1965 that had our joint forces to operate, but on this agreement, the first one was signed on 4th of March 2017 by this new government, and now signed again 2018. And they have asked us to ask the colonels. We are civilians, we are retired, we are not going to be involved in that, but the commanders will come on the ground to work out what to accept and what not to accept. And of course, the, 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 this committee on, the select committee on defense and security will be very integral to that. But, um, it's, it's, it's not, we've not agreed on the details here. We've not agreed. So anything that happened must have been some faux pas, and the government has engaged the relevant authorities to look for avenues of redress and to avoid a recurrence until we agree, Gambia agree that, yes, we agree on this, they agree, then we'll do it together. And, of course, we will come back here to inform you accordingly. Thank you. Honorable Member for Busumbala, supplementary, one minute. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Minister, I want to know this, this hot pursue pact, whether it's an institutional agreement, that means between the Army of Armed Forces of Senegal and the Gambia, or an international agreement. Because I, what I believe, if it is an international agreement, it has to be ratified in the National Assembly. It has to come to the National Assembly for ratification. Then, as, as the case is, Madam Speaker, as the case is now, I, yes, I, I didn't finish. You have asked a question, a no, supplementary no, question. No, I didn't finish. No, let's be fair. You have asked a question. Let him answer the no, question. No, my question is pregnant. It has two babies inside. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, let, you cannot ask a sub question to a supplementary. No, let, let, no. let, let, let the pregnant, pregnant woman okay. deliver. My, my, my ruling is let the Honorable um, no, let me Minister my answer your question, please. Let me, no, it's part of a question. It's not finished. Can I, can I complete the question, Madam Speaker? Okay, let me withdraw that. Let me withdraw that one. Let me, I withdraw the first one. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Um, very good. Honorable Minister. Based on the cry of the Gambian people expressing their unsatisfiedness of, of the intrusion of Senegalese uh, forces into the, into the country, would it be possible for your ministry and the government to go back and revise 
revise the agreement to avoid the continuation of the uh, Senegalese entering into the country as, as they are doing. Thank you. Do respect. That's a completely new question. I um, mean, really, look at the question again. The question talks about hot posting. And the Honorable Minister has given, you know, so, and, uh, um, answers to, to, to it. And there has been, as well, supplementary questions to it. So, if, really, I will, I will rule that. You come again with a new substantive question, yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister. With all due respect, I cannot give you a third chance. Uh, you see, let me come again. <laughs> well, no, no, we can move. Honorable Minority Leader, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable mm. Minister, uh, mm. I have listening to your answers. Coming from the member for Jaramis, when he asks if Gambia want to disassociate themselves with the with this agreement but you are unable to give us answer and you are telling us the agreements are signed and then i believe before you sign an agreement you must peruse through all the articles in the agreement you know what is in the agreement then you come and append your signature before signing so if you are telling us that you have the agreement are signed but you cannot tell us whether in any of the articles that if the Gambia want to um, divorce themselves, actually there is a provision in the article. I think you should, um, uh, you being the Minister of Defense, I don't know whether it, it was during your time, but you could have perished through all this, um, how to call, all this agreement, then come to assembly so that at least you can give us the relevant information. Thank you. Honorable member, I told you that this agreement signing of this agreement started on the 4th of March 2017. I was then Consul General in Saudi Arabia. We are gathering all these instruments. What I can tell you is what your laws and our laws have said, we have to come here when the need arises for ratification. A government and the leadership of signing. But what now should be when you sign, then you come for ratification. But we have not got to a stage of doing that right now. Even the commanders have not agreed on what to do. So to us, anything happened is something that was, as I said, a faux pas or some errors that happened, and we are trying to fix. This government is trying to fix these things we have inherited. There was nothing like this before. And no Minister of Defense has ever come here to talk about border issues and something. I think we should appreciate, and let me repeat, they are mutually beneficial agreements and not in any way an attempt to surrender the sovereignty of the Gambia as often wrongly portrayed by some quarters. With due respect, honorable members, we are on what you want for the Gambia, that's what I want for the Gambia, and we are going to protect the sovereignty of this country when the time comes to bring it for ratification to, you, to the plenary. Thank the you. I'm Upper Fuller the West. Thank you. Um, Honorable Speaker, can the Honorable Minister, if he has any information on this agreement, since no, he, is, he uh, didn't partake no, in the, uh, the initial signatures, can he shed light on the limitations of, of the framework or the parameters no, of w uh, what is contained in this agreement as far as pursuits are concerned? Uh, yes, I think that's the question. Honorable Member, I think, unless if I'm allowed to read it again, I've already read the conditions of our agreement mm -hmm. until when I concluded, we talked about five kilometers into each other's country. If I am allowed, I can read again the, the agreement on, on, on hot pursuit. Already done that, so that would, be, that would amount to a repetition. I don't think it is necessary. Mm -hmm. Avoid this rephrasing of questions and just ask direct. For the last time, I will allow it, but please, next time, let's try. Yes, um, the minister did inform us about you know, uh, some of the limitations. You know, I'm asking him, you know, does, is, there, is that the only limitations or there are other limitations? Uh, given our geographical uh, standing in this agreement, Gambia is surrounded by Senegal. 
maybe Senegal, Senegalese can uh, run, uh, run from Senegal into other jurisdictions, but Gambians cannot run you know, from Gambia. But don't Kenya. you think that when the assembly, when the agreement comes before the National Assembly, you will have more than enough opportunity? I, I, as I said, the Defense Committee is very strong, and I'm sure you're looking forward to that. So let's wait for that time. Thank you very much. In fact, we've taken, in view of the duplication of questions, we've taken more than seven, so we will now have to proceed, move forward. And the Honorable Minister had two questions, from one from Jimara, the other one from the member for Kian East. Um, and that brings to an end the number of his questions for today. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister for Defense, for those answers provided to this August Assembly. Clark, can we now proceed with the Attorney General? You are now released. Thank you very much. You. Questions for oral answers continues. We now proceed with the Honorable Attorney General and Minister for Justice. Thank you very much. Questions for which due notices were given to the Honorable Attorney General and the Minister for Justice by Honorable Members for oral reply. Question number 235 by the, of 2019, these are the December 2019, it is a December 2019 question, Honorable Member for Serekunda. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Would the Honorable Minister of Justice indicate to this August body how much the government has spent on the Jamme Commission? Jane Commission. How much money has been recovered so far in cash and kind? And how much the government realistically expect to recover. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Good afternoon, Honorable Members. I thank the Honorable Member for Sarah Kunda for his question. Madam Speaker, as at 15 June 2020, our records at the Ministry of Justice indicate that at a total cost of $116,909,077 associated with the Janet Commission recovery effort between July 2017 and June 2020, we have recovered a total amount of $1,110,000,000. And two hundred and twenty seven dollars net, as well as an additional amount of eighty eight million five hundred and thirty five thousand net committed but still outstanding. The recoveries have all been paid into a designated special recoveries account at the Central Bank of the Gambia under the control of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, except an amount of fifty million dollars which was paid directly to the TIRC Victims Trust Fund as government's initial contribution to the fund. The total amount includes the proceeds of sale of some assets, payments made by some individuals against whom adverse findings were made by the Janet Commission, and other monies generated from the activities of the Janet Commission itself. Madam Speaker, I am proud to say that even at this early stage of recoveries, this is by far the most successful assets recovery exercise ever undertaken in this country. With just over 11% of the total property sold, we have almost reached the $1 billion target we had expected to generate from the sale of all the properties forfeited to the state and have already surpassed this figure in our overall assets recovery efforts. 
a full report of the process will be submitted to the government together with an audit report of the entire process at the end of the exercise. And the government will be glad to share these with the assembly. Madam Speaker, I am not sure what the Honorable Member for Sirakuna means by in-kind recoveries. Perhaps he could help clarify what exactly he means by this. In any event, we have attached to this response an inventory of items marked A that have been recovered from the former president. Madam Speaker, with regards to the total amount the government realistically expects to recover, this is proving difficult to ascertain at this point in time as we continue to exceed expectations in the sale of the assets. I am, however, advised that based on the current process of sale, we expect to raise at least $1.4 billion from the assets already identified for sale. However, this amount may increase if the ministerial task force adds other properties to the list of assets to be sold. May I also add that this is based on the assumption that the COVID-19 pandemic will not have an impact on the sale process as some purchasers may rely on bank financing to purchase the assets. Meanwhile, Madam Speaker, we are also vigorously pursuing other leads outside the country arising from the Janet Commission inquiry. For instance, a lead from the Commission proceedings have led to the recent discovery of millions of dollars, which has now been frozen in a foreign bank account pending the conclusion of our efforts to return the money back to the country. This is, of course, a more complex process and obviously require, requires a high degree of confidentiality pending the final outcome. We are working with a number of foreign governments and partners that are assisting us recover this money. Others outside the country have also reached out to initiate discussions on possible return of some monies back to the country. The two most important points to take home at this moment is that A, some money has been discovered in a foreign bank account, and B, that the foreign bank account is now frozen as we understand it. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Honorable Minister. Yes, Serekunda, you have two questions. Speaker, the first leg of the question uh, is still hanging, Honorable Speaker. That is, how much has actually been spent? Look at the first leg of the question. How much has actually been spent? On the, in the commission itself, is trying to make a comparative analysis, expenditure, and what has been achieved. Um, it is difficult to tell you exactly how much is spent at this time, and that's because, unfortunately and regrettably, um, the commission payments, some of the commission payments, we have been done in areas. And as I am standing here right now, um, there is still some payment outstanding to the commissions. They have been on my back, and, but I believe it will be resolved or it has been resolved in the course of this week. I think after this week, hopefully when the final payment is made to the commission, I will be able to provide you with the expenditure on the commission exclusively. Thank you. Well, I believe in terms of the presumption, in terms of kind, that's precisely what was meant by kind, cattle, and everything else that is not cash. And uh, since that is given, uh, the, the question is answered. Thank you very much. Um, Lower Salu. Um, thank you, I'm Honorable Speaker. Um, Honorable Minister, did the Commission has the mandate to sell um, the former president's asset? According to the commission, they did. Thank you very much, Ilyasa. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. 
Why do you pay fifty million dollars to TRC? Why? Who authorized you to do that? Well, the government decided. With the TRC, <laughs> the government decided to contribute towards the Victims Plus Fund of the TRC, and it carried a huge symbolic value for this um, amount to have come from the proceeds of sale of the former president, who, in our view and based on revelations of the TRC, was at the center of the human rights violations and abuses. Um, Opa Nyomi. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for giving me the floor. Madam Speaker, could Honorable Minister explain by what he mean by all the money generated from the Ghana Commission activities. Exactly what are those activities, if you can please explain. Well, those activities include the sale of the cattle, the sale of some tractors and some um, other um, vehicles. I think I have reported on that previously before this assembly. Um, it's basically the activities that the Ghana Commission undertook. Um, while it was still um, conducting its proceedings. Thank you, Banjo Self. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It is a noble gesture returning the revenue accrued from, the, from this commission, but I would like the Honorable Minister to tell us who, um, he said that there are some committed and still outstanding from whom, um, and also to provide to this August Assembly the full list of the people that have bought the assets a full list and, and the prices that they have paid. Thank you. I think that is included in, the, in one of the responses already provided to you in terms of those who purchase the assets and the valuations. Um, yes, they are included on your list. In fact, it's right there at the top, at the top of your, in your, in your hand. Yes. Inform that the question is part of another question, so let's not preempt the answer. Yes, so if you can just withdraw the supplementary question so we can give chance to others and wait for the other one. No, you cannot have your cake and eat no, it no. at the same time, otherwise, you, you may lose the other okay. opportunity. Because so, there's, there's why don't you just part. withdraw this one? We wait for the other no, one, no, and then one you can bring the it on board. There's one part that is not answered. It's the one that says that there are some people committed. He said in his answer, if there are some committals, I, I would want him to tell us from whom and how much. Um, the how much is already in there. It's 88,535,000. The, um, the, the class of persons who have committed what's still outstanding, uh, principally two. There is one category who have negotiated with the government to pay on the basis of the Janet Commission report. We have been flexible in that because our primary objective is recoveries. They have made part payments. There is an agreement for them to make um, payments later. Um, there is also a second category, that is those who have already purchased these properties. Some of them, unfortunately, um, ran into difficulties, particularly under the COVID situation, and they requested for a flexibility on the part of government to allow them um, some time to complete the payments. We allow that. So those are the two categories who are committed but still outstanding. Thank you. Um, Jara is. So, thank you. Uh, if you go to the inventory, you have name, Unit condition, Benz Compreso E200, condition indicated. But if you turn page two, TV flash screen one, condition not indicated. I would like to know. Thank you. Well, I guess the team that took the inventory um, did their best to identify the conditions of some of the um, properties, the assets. And in the case of those that Perhaps they needed to put on the TV to ensure that the condition was good. In the absence of that, they can't tell you whether um, um, they can describe the conditions. That's the best explanation I can give. But in so far as we're concerned, we took the inventory. Um, those that we could describe the conditions, we did. Those we can't, we couldn't describe the conditions, we did not. 
Unless we've exhausted our seven questions, seven supplementary on the question. So we proceed with the next question. Question number 59, that's the March question. 59 of 2020 by the Honorable Member for Upper Salum. Um, thank, yeah. thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Um, Honorable Speaker, as the Janet Commission has submitted their findings to the President of the Republic in 2019 with recommendations, can the Honorable Attorney General and the Minister of Justice tell this August Assembly the legal framework in place to recover the assets and who are those responsible in the process of recovery, assessment, and the sale of these properties? Honorable Speaker, following the submission in March 2019 of the report of the Janet Commission, His Excellency the President, in line with Section 203 of the 1997 Constitution, published in September 2019 his comments on the report in the form of a government white paper, accepting almost all of the recommendations of the Commission. The white paper was also gazetted. On the advice of the Attorney General, the President established a ministerial task force comprising the Ministers of Justice, Local Government and Lands, Tourism and Culture, and Agriculture to, among other things, determine what actions to be taken in respect of the forfeited properties of former President Jame and his close associates as recommended by the Commission, i.e., to decide on what properties to be disposed by sale or retain for other government use, and to generally handle pending third party claims against some of the said properties. Another interministerial task force was simultaneously established at the technical level to advise the ministers on their decisions. It comprised the Solicitor General and the permanent secretaries at the ministries of finance local government and lands, tourism and culture, and agriculture. The ministries constituting the task force were selected based on relevance, starting with the Ministry of Justice, which has overall responsibility for the assets recovery process. The Ministry of Local Government and Lands, which naturally deals with land matters in the country, and a substantial number of the properties forfeited were state lands, while other properties were situated in the tourism development area or our agricultural land, which explains the inclusion of the ministries of tourism and agriculture. In July 2019, based on the recommendation of the Commission, Alpha Capital Advisory, a reputable local chartered accountancy firm, was appointed to take over from Augustus Prom, another reputable local accountancy firm. The latter was the receiver I appointed when the set assets were frozen by the High Court pursuant to the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2012. Alpha Capital Advisory was thereafter instructed to liquidate the properties identified for sale by the Interministerial Task Force. The Ministerial Task Force has initially identified for sale 44 properties belonging to former President Jame. 15 properties that belong to Baba K. Job, which were forfeited to the state after his conviction in 2004, but taken over by President Jame, and seven properties that belong to General Saul Bayi, all mainly in the Greater Bangil area and the West Coast region. 11 properties were identified for possible government use. The task force did not take a decision on some other properties pending an inspection of the properties. That inspection is yet to take place. The list of properties to be sold, together with the valuations for each of the properties commissioned by the Janet Commission, was shared by the Ministry of Justice with Alpha Capital for the initiation of the sale process. All the said properties were inspected, identified, and pictures taken of them. The properties were to be sold by way of closed bids. Guide prices were then established through a revised valuation of these properties. This was conducted by an independent professional valuer 
with support from representatives of the Department of Lands and the Sheriff's Division of the High Court, who had prepared the initial valuations at the instance of the Commission. The services of a web design company were engaged to create a website which was used to advertise the assets to be sold. The information uploaded includes pictures of the assets, their descriptions, dimensions, and guide price. Bidding forms and copies of the newspaper advertisements were also uploaded on the website. Due to the large number of properties identified for sale, the properties were to be sold in phases. The properties were also advertised in the local newspapers as follows. In phase one, the advertisement ran from 4th September with a deadline of 18th September 2019. The second phase ran from 7th October with a deadline of 25th October 2019. And the third phase ran from 18th November with a deadline of 2nd December 2019. To attract a wider clientele, especially for international participation, the advertisements were uploaded on the website. Bidding forms were also available at the reception of a designated address for potential buyers to submit their bids at the set office. For bids received in hard copy, details of the bidders were collected, their names, their addresses, their contact numbers and email addresses. The envelopes were signed to confirm their sealed status, collected and kept in a secured safe. The completed bids were to be either hand-delivered by envelope to the designated address or sent by email to a domain, which is password protected. Bids were closed to the public in accordance with the prescribed terms and conditions. The opening of the bids coincides with the respective closing dates as advertised. All the sealed bids were brought to the Ministry of Justice to commence the evaluation processes, which are usually chaired by the Solicitor General, who would inspect the bid envelopes to confirm that they are intact. The electronic bids are also viewed using passwords provided to each bidder. The bids are then opened at the Ministry of Justice in the presence of a senior official, in most cases the Solicitor General. The respective bid amounts are announced to everyone present and the results collated and ranked to determine the highest bidders. For assets of significant value, the bidders are also invited to be present at the opening of the bids. A brief report of the results is immediately shared in writing with the Solicitor General via email. This is usually followed by a detailed written report the next business day. The respective winners are called on the same day that the bids are open and informed of their success. This is followed by a formal letter on the following working day. The letter details out the property, bid amount, and a seven-day deadline for payment. Delays and or challenges encountered by the purchasers are always brought to the attention of the Attorney General. In some instances, purchases were cancelled and refunds made to some purchasers. For instance, the purchaser of Hamza Barracks was refunded his money after a decision was made to retain the property for government use. The purchaser of number 26 Buckle Street was also refunded his money after withdrawing his offer based on financial constraints. The purchaser of Yundum Citro Products was refunded his money due to the delay in facilitating their confirmation of the land's dimension. This land is being partially used by the Gambia National Army. For properties sold but with occupants, adequate eviction notices of at least six months were issued to the occupants to vacate the properties so that the purchasers can take vacant possession. In such cases, private security companies would be engaged to provide 24 hours a week security service at the locations. The sale of the 32 properties and equipment and company shares that belong to Mr. Mohamed Bazi has so far generated $855 million net. 
This has been paid into a designated special recoveries account at the Central Bank of the Gambia under the control of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, except, as I said, an amount of $50 million which was paid directly to the TIRC Victims Trust Fund as government's initial contribution to the fund. Madam Speaker, honorable members, on pages six and seven and part of eight, you will find the list of properties that were sold in the different phases. 14 properties were sold in phase one, six properties sold in phase two, and 12 properties sold in phase three. Madam Speaker, the ministerial task force was also mandated by the president to handle pending third party claims against some of the forfeited properties as recommended by the Jane Commission. Madam Speaker, this is the procedure and framework in place for the recovery of assets pursuant to the recommendations of the Jane Commission. Allow me to add that the said process has been very satisfactory in terms of both the transparency and the outcome. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Attorney General and Minister for Justice. Honorable Member for um, Upper Salum, you have any supplementary questions? Yes, on, only one, answer. because I think he gave me one, more than what I asked for, but it's okay. Now, the only question I have is on the page five of the answer, where he said, for property sold, but the occupants adequate eviction notices of at least six months were issued to the occupants to vacate the properties so, the, so that the purchasers can take vacant position. So I would just like to ask the Honorable Minister, how, what exactly are you doing to ensure that that's been done? Because I'm, I'm a victim. Sorry, say, is your question what exactly? Are, are you doing to ensure that they give at least a minimum of six months for, for property that are already occupied? At least, yeah. Well, clear express instructions were given to my staff, actually, to, my, to the personnel who in my office is the focal point for these activities. And I have been assured that the six months notices were given to each and every occupant of these properties. If you tell me that you are a victim, well, um, please do bring it. You've brought it to my attention now, but I would like to have further details so that I can take this up with the personnel in my office. Thank you. Member um, Yakumba. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Honorable Minister, I would just um, like to know why was um, Alpha Capital chosen as a receiver instead of using AMRC, and how much did it cost the Commission to um, engage their services? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I will start with why AMRC was not chosen, if you don't mind. I refer this House to the establishment order for the Commission of Inquiry, of the Jani Commission, particularly paragraph one of the preamble, which says that preliminary reports Honorable Speaker, with your permission, I would like to read. <laughs> the standing orders indicate not more than two minutes, but I think this is important, so I can speaker. use my discretion to extend the response. Yes, yes just very briefly. Not more than five minutes, please. So I won't be more than five minutes. So have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. And I read, preliminary reports received from, among other things, the Central Bank of the Gambia, Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation, Gambia Ports, Authority, Gambia Telecommunications Company Limited, NAWEC, Assets Management and Recovery Corporation, Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, and other public institutions and government sources indicate that substantial funds were either directly or indirectly withdrawn, paid out, or expended on instructions or directives received from the office of the president during the tenure in office of former President Jame, sometimes for unknown purposes. Now, based on the establishment order here, the Commission was to inquire into the activities of the AMRC. Now, this is what the Commission says in its report, volumes one and two at page 37. 
and I quote, all of the public enterprises the commission was mandated to investigate, only the AMRC escaped our scrutiny. This must not be interpreted as a clean bill of health stamped by us in favor of AMRC. We simply did not have sufficient time to conduct a thorough investigation of assets management and recoveries cooperation. We therefore recommend as follows. A, that a small committee of public servants be set up to conduct investigations into the past affairs of AMRC concerning land and commodity transactions. And B, that the committee shall determine whether AMRC's existence is still justified. And if so, whether the AMRC Act is ripe for major amendments with a view to enhancing the efficiency and accountability of the corporation. In view of these reasons, we couldn't entrust this activity to the AMRC because they, as the Commission recommended and as the government also indicated in its establishment order, should be investigated. Now, the reason why, for your other leg of the question, we appointed Alpha Capital Advisor. I again refer you to Volume 4 of the Commission report at page 51 on the general recommendations. And this is what the Commission says. KGI and all business entities under it should be liquidated. A liquidator should be appointed other than the receiver previously appointed by the High Court. So based on these two reasons, we appointed Alpha Capital to conduct this assets recovery exercise on behalf of the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, no. sorry. I think there was a sorry. third element. How much was paid to Alpha Capital? Well, we um, negotiated with Alpha Capital and paid him initially for the first six months, because I always give out six monthly um, contracts. Um, in the event we need to stop the process, we don't have to tie ourselves down to a longer period. We negotiated between, 10, between 5 and 10 percent, and as the sales are progressing, we are seeing the, um, the, the, the profits that were being made. We decided on subsequent um, extensions to peg it at 5 percent. If you compare that to what we paid to Augustus Pum, which was 10 to 15 percent, um, during their um, tenure as receivers. But even better if you compare it to what we're paying the partners who are assisting us with the recovery of assets outside the country, where we're paying between 15 to 20 percent. Thank you. Um, Fonyi Bintan Karanlai. Uh, Honorable Speaker, would the Honorable Attorney General uh, also indicate uh, why the whole sum, whole sum including what was given to TRC, was not just maintained in a centralized account until the whole legal process is complete. Due to the fact that uh, those with adverse findings do have the right uh, to appeal. Thank you, Honorable Member. I'm sure you must have um, seen a few agitations by some of the victims as to what the government or the TRC indeed is doing to assist on an interim basis even, particularly for those who need urgent medical care. I'll just um, add that the money that was given to the Victims Trust Fund was to enable the TRC to um, assist these victims, and I'm happy to share that part of this money was used by the TRRC to assist um, some of the victims who were taking for urgent medical treatment in Turkey. So this is to allow to give out interim reparations to the victims. It has uh, got nothing to do with the um, potential culprits who may be found um, to have been engaged in these human rights violations. The government has a responsibility, no matter what, to assist the victims. And this has been done um, at interim so that the TRRC can also fulfill part of its goodwill mandate. Sir Kunda West, did you, yes, right, right, yes. Uh, thank you. Honorable Minister, you did say almost all the recommendations were accept, accepted. I want to know 
What are the recommendations that were not accepted and on what basis? Um, I refer you to the government white paper, which clearly says that the government accepts all the recommendations of the Janet Commission except where it expressly rejects it. And the government white paper identifies where the recommendations have been rejected in the white paper. I refer you, I can provide you with a copy of the white paper, Honorable, after here. I have several copies in my office. Thank you. Forwarded in addition to the National Assembly. The reason, the reason why we could not circulate it, they're very bulky and we don't have the vote for it. So if you have additional copies, please make it available so that everybody will have a copy. Thank you. Madam we'll Speaker, if I may just, <laughs> I don't want to leave the record. Um, appearing that we didn't. We have submitted some copies to the um, speaker's office, to the clerk's office. We couldn't make a copy for every member because our budget is also not, unfortunately, as hefty as yours here. System fund. <laughs> to accommodate that. Um, okay, thank you very much. Lower <laughs> Nyomi. Madam Speaker, I want to remind you that yesterday around this time you gave us the leave to go and have lunch and also pray, come back after an hour or so. But the question I want to put before you, you grant us leave is given the recommendation that was made for the AMR, AMRC, what steps have you taken to move to investigate or find out about the AMRC? Well, various options have been considered. As I said, there is an interministerial task force already constituted to look at pending third party claims as well and to basically oversee this assess recovery process. Um, it may be that we will use this task force to um, carry out the Commission's recommendations or there may be another task force. But so far, not much has been done on that score. Well, we're having to prioritize our activities, and since it's on my head, on my shoulders, I, I'm sure you understand my um, time is very stretched, and I will, I'll have to um, carry out my work in order of priority. Um, but certainly the AMRC agenda is at the top of, of the list, hopefully maybe before the end of this year. Um, minority, I'm mindful of your intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Minister, on your answer on, on Honorable Mbou's question, the third page, where you have 44 properties belonging to the former president, 15 properties that belong to Baba K. Job. Okay, if you go to the other paper that you submitted, that is Mark Exhibit B, where you have properties of Baba Job. I can see there is some sales there. So here it is indicated properties of Baba Job. In this case, the sales, who, where do the proceeds go? The proceeds of the sales of property, the properties of Baba Job. Well, I mean, as you widely quoted me, the idea is just to identify the description of the property so that we all know what properties we're talking about. But these are properties that were forfeited to the state. In fact, there was a double forfeiture order, one by the High Court, which after convicting Baba Job, forfeited the properties to the state, and two by the Commission on its own findings against Baba Job. So um, this is just to aid us in terms of identifying the properties because the Commission in its findings um, separated the properties of Jame and those of Baba Job. And we just wanted to be consistent in that. But it makes no difference. As far as we're concerned, the are properties that belong to former President Jame ultimately, and there were orders to forfeit them to the state. Thank you. Yara is. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Minister, you'll agree with me that some of the forfeited properties outlive their usefulness. What do you intend to do with them? Thank you. Well, I suppose that is why we have this interministerial task force with another task force at the permanent secretary level 
to advise. They have just concluded their report on um, what we should do with the rest of the properties. Um, the ministerial task force is scheduled to meet either tomorrow or early next week to consider the task force of the technical level on what we should do with each of those properties. Honorable members, I think this is a convenient point for us to suspend the sitting, go for a short break, and come back for the June questions for the Honorable Attorney General. We would have proceeded, but we still have about three or four additional questions for him, and it's not likely that we'll be able to finish that before three o'clock. That is in half an hour's time. So I think it's only fair we go for a short break and come back in an hour's time at 3.30. So the sitting is suspended till 3.30. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, guys. We are going for a lunch break. Uh, we will be coming back by 3.30. Uh, you can, the quick on uh, uh, we will continue with the Minister of Justice in regards to question and answer session that has been going on in regards to the China Commission on the sales of Jamia properties and other, other co connected matters relating to the Ministry. And we still have the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Trade. All of them will come and take the floor for question and answers regarding their ministries. So, and the Minister of Finance will be a very heated debate because it deals with the finance of the country and the monies that have so far uh, you know, been given to the Gambian government either by loan or grant. You know, many uh, questions are there for clarity to know where those monies were spent and how they come and the loans and the grant that have been given. So stay with me. I will be back by 3.30 to follow this session, to continue this session. Thank you, Mr. Brother Kek Sane. Thank you. 